Hey guys, today uh, we're going to be looking at ancient India geography. So we're going to be looking at Indian geography, um, but before we get into it, I've got a joke to tell you. I scoured the internet far and wide for an Indian geography joke, and this was the best I could come up with. What day, no, when does Monday come? Mun soon. Haha. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't get it either. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's the best thing. All right, so let's look at some Indian geography. The geography of India includes high mountains, great rivers, and heavy seasonal rain. All right, so we're going to look at it right here. We have a map of, a physical map of India up here in the corner. So we have high mountains, great rivers, and heavy seasonal rain. In just a second, I want you to pause the video, and I want you to answer these questions. Super easy. Don't overthink it. But elaborate, you know, we're looking at four skills here. Elaborate, why is India called a subcontinent? Describe, what is the shape of the Indian subcontinent? Contrast, how is the geography of northeastern India different from northwestern India? Remember, don't overthink this. And then draw inferences. Why might Indian farmers consider the monsoons both a blessing and a curse? We will get to that last one later on. All right, so take a second right now and pause your video and just jot down what you think the answers to these questions are. All right, so you should have the answer written down by now. Um, again, let's not overthink this, okay? So why is India called a subcontinent? Essentially, it is smaller than a regular continent, but it is a large landmass and it's separated from the rest of Asia by some very distinct physical features. Uh, those dis distinct features are a couple of mountain ranges and also some major rivers. But it is a large, it's smaller than a continent, but larger than a normal land mass, all right? Um, what is the shape of India? Triangle, diamond, any of those two? Hey, you, know, you don't have to get too deep into that. And then, um, how is the geography of Northeastern India different from Northwestern India? Well, in the Northeast, we have mountains, we have the Himalayans. Uh, in the northwest, we have the Indus River and then the Hindu Kush Mountains. We have two different mountain range. Um, but we also have a river valley and a desert in this up here. Um, draw inferences. So why might Indian farmers consider the monsoons both a blessing and a curse? Climate-wise, we have monsoons that bring summer floods and monsoons that also bring dry winters. How is it both a blessing and a curse? Well, we'll come back to that at, at the end of this video. So, the geography and climate of India, let's, let's dive further in. Uh, so India, India being a subcontinent, isolated by oceans and mountains. So again, right, we have these mountains, we have the desert and mountains river up here, then we have these oceans. This, what this does allow is for a level of protection. Right, we did not have a lot of invaders coming in from the east because of this. Um, Semi-tropical, hot, hot, wet summer and cold, dry climate. Huge geographic diversity in terms of uh, arability and climate. So, what does geographic diversity mean for people? And what does this actually mean for people? Take a second, pause, and write down what you think the answer is. So what it means for people is economic and cultural diversity. Right? When we look at the early ancient peoples, so we're looking at classical civilizations, so much of it is around geographic diversity. And so, you know, surrounding, uh, going to these early river valley civilizations especially, and we're going to talk more of it in my next video, but ge the geography is actually what allowed that to happen. So some of the major river systems, there's two major river systems. While there are a number of rivers in uh, in India, we're going to be looking at two river systems right now. One, the Indus River, located uh, in modern Pakistan. It's about 1,800 miles long and one of the earliest, some of the earliest civilizations in all of history can be found around this. Uh, the Harappan civilization flourished from 2,500 to 1,500 BC. You guys, one thing I want to talk about here that's super important about the Harappan civilization, what we can be very grateful for is the ones who gave us the first indoor plumbing. Yeah, that's right, first indoor toilets, 
Thank you, early Indus Valley civilizations. You guys are incredible. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about the Indus River, if you guys can see here, up here in this corner, is it can travel to the Arabian Sea, right? And why would this be good? Why would it be good for them to be able to travel to the Arabian Sea? Well, the reason is the fact that it opens up trade early, right? So one of the advantages that India had that some of the Eastern civilizations, like when we look at classical China, is that they were actually able to trade uh, with some of the Western civilizations early, earlier than the Eastern civilizations. So certain technologies were able to come there. Um, and so that was one thing that allowed them to do. So the other major river is the Ganges River, and it is located in northern India, uh, 1,560 miles long, and relied upon for the fertile farmland in northern India and religiously significant. So I want to touch real quick back on the Indus versus Ganges idea. The Indus River, um, one, of the, one of the possible explanations for the disappearance of the earliest civilizations is it was inconsistent. Right? When the flooding happened, the river could change paths and all of a sudden the civilizations that were on a river are no longer on a river. That's just a theory, we don't know for sure, but that's one possibility. Um, but the Ganges River was more reliable, right? Because you had the runoff every year coming down from the Himalayans. So they knew when the waters were gonna flood, they knew when they were gonna rescind. And so there was a little a level of reliability, which also would have helped them, you know, they could rely upon it for fertile farmland, but also it would, it would develop a religious significance, right? It would actually be important for rituals and such. Um, and so they would realize, they would believe that gods would actually, the various deities would actually be in charge of the river. And so th that began to develop around it. And so the Ganges is actually considered a sacred river for uh, Indian culture. Um, one other key feature is the Himalayan mountains. Uh, tallest mountain range in the world and isolated India from the rest of Asia, right? Like everybody's heard of Mount Everest, right? Like the tallest in the world. Um, how did they get there? They broke off the continent of Africa and rammed into Asia, right? So ancient speaking, we believe that that happened. Separated India from regions in northeastern China, provides terrain for raising some animals and protects from invasion by some foreign invaders, right? It really did um, separate them from uh, Eastern Asia. So it is a level of protection that comes in there. Uh, and also it developed, it, it caused, um, you know, and it impacted the way that their societies grew. And the idea that the terrain was used more used for raising animals, right? As opposed to agriculture. Uh, while there was irrigation for agriculture from the Ganges, the mountains, not as, it was harder for them to do that. Um, let's see here. So the other thing we want to look at here, the other major part. So we have the various rivers, we have the mountains, we also have our coastal regions, but we have the Deccan Plateau, Deccan, Deccan Plateau, which was an area that tended to be drier, and what that actually led was to herding and farming. And throughout history, it also meant that there was a lot of smaller kingdoms that were kind of broken up in during that in that region. Um, I'm back here real quick. I want to go back to the coastal the coastal areas here. We're looking at the coastal regions of of India. Something to keep in mind was for the for the area for the people in the India that lived around the coast, the major sources of income and growth were from obviously trading and also fishing, right? And so they were some of the earliest traders, but they're also uh, where they did a lot of fishing. All right. So when the Indus River flooded nearby. Land, it did what? So I want you to pause it, answer this question. A, forced early settlers to become nomads. B, left behind rich, fertile soil, perfect for farming. C, destroyed the first Indian civilization, Harappa. And then D, ruined crops and the people starved. Pause now. All right, if you guessed B, left behind rich, fertile soil, perfect for farming, you were correct. Congratulations. All right, let's look at monsoons now. So what? are monsoons. What are they? So monsoons are strong winds that blow in one direction. Summer winds are hot and wet and come from the southwest. Winter, are they are cold and dry and come from the northeast. So how did the monsoons impact India? Well, 
They were good and they were bad. You're gonna to wanna to remember that, right? They were good and bad. They were great for farming, right? When you had a good monsoon season, the the native or the Indians were able to actually produce like double crop, right? Like they could harvest twice. But on the other hand, they were unpredictable, right? So they're good for farming, but they're unpredictable, which would mean they sometimes they'd be in drought, but also sometimes they would bring flood. Um, so to wrap up this short video on Indian geography, I want you to think and write, all right, what impact did geographic diversity of India have on its early political life? I want you to think about this and then put an answer on Power School. All right, put your answer in there. What impact did geographic diversity of India have on its early political life? All right.